Donald Trump passed through here, so we had a minute to talk with him. Let's roll that tape. You can see what he had to say. Well, I've never seen anything like it. I've seen two huge 110-story buildings that are reduced to rubble, uh, thousands and thousands of lives. I just got to see something that I've never seen before. I have hundreds of men inside working right now, and we're bringing down another 125 in a little while, and they've never done work like this before. And they're hardworking people, but they've never seen anything like it, and they've never, they've never done work like this before. It's terrible. Tell me what it's like at Ground Zero. Tell me about the workers that you saw and, and what they're doing there. Well, not only is it devastation, but it's very dangerous because every few minutes a whistle would go off and everybody would just run because you have all the buildings around it, which are in such a weakened state that people just don't know. And so they just have to take off. And then they come back and they're working under 50-story buildings that you don't know if they're, gonna, if they're gonna fall down. So it's a terrible thing for the workers and it's a terrible thing for the world, really. How have you spoken to any of your men? Do you know how they're reacting to this? Because emotionally, this must be so incredibly difficult. Well, there are a lot of them, but they've never seen bodies like this. I mean, the bodies all over. The uh, I mean, the, the great thing is when they find somebody that's alive, like the five firemen that they just found a little while ago. So that's the great thing, and that's what they're all striving for. But uh, generally speaking, that's not what the case. That's not the case. So. They are working very, very hard, but it's it's a very depressing situation for these folks. As you walked around and as you saw the piles of rubble, there are thousands of families out there who are hoping that someone might be in a pocket somewhere, still alive, still breathing, waiting to be dug up. As you assessed that damage from your perspective, do you believe that's possible? Well, I, I would certainly not want to be the one to say it's not possible. Certainly, it's. Uh, it's a tough situation, but you can't give up hope because there's always hope. I mean, the five men, I'm sure their families thought that they probably were gone, and now they walk in the door. A couple of them walked away after they were dug out. So there probably are some more people in there, and therefore you can't give up hope. You've had an impact on the skyline of New York. What is it like as you see it now? It's like a whole different skyline. It's like a whole different city and world. Uh, I cannot believe the sight of Lower Manhattan without the World Trade Center, and therefore we have to rebuild, not necessarily in that form, but we have to rebuild uh, at least as good and maybe better. Just finally, can you tell me emotionally as you walked around, we have, we have heard some of the stories from the firemen. They're so exhausted uh, and, and mentally and physically. What was it like for you personally to go in and see all of what you saw? Well, it was amazing to see it. It was a very depressing scene, but I'll tell you what, you really can take heart. These firemen and policemen and the construction workers equally the courage they have is unbelievable. I mean, they're working, digging out, and lifting up steel. And above them, you have 55-story buildings that are very possibly going to be pouring down on them any minute. And they're working like nothing's wrong. Best known builder, uh, particularly of, of, of great buildings in the city, there's a great deal of question about whether or not the damage and, and the ultimate destruction of the buildings was caused by the airplanes, by architectural defect, or possibly by bombs or, or aftershocks. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it was an architectural defect. You know, the World Trade Center was always known as a very, very strong building. Don't forget, that took a big bomb in the basement. Now, the basement is the most vulnerable place because that's your foundation, and it withstood that. And I got to see that area about three or four days after it took place because one of my structural engineers actually took me for a tour because he did the building. And I said, I can't believe it. The building was standing solid and half of the columns were blown out. I mean, so this was an unbelievably powerful building. Uh, if you know anything about structure, it was one of the first buildings that was built from the outside. The steel, the reason the World Trade Center had such narrow windows is that in between all the windows, you had the steel on the outside. So you had the steel on the outside of the building. That's why when I first looked, and you had big, heavy I-beams. When I first looked at it, I couldn't believe it because there was a hole in the steel. And this is steel that was, you remember the, the width of the windows in the World Trade Center, folks. I think, you you know, if you were ever up there, they were quite narrow. And in between was this heavy steel. I said, how could a plane, even a plane, even a 767 or 747, or whatever it might have been, how could it possibly go through the steel? I happen to think that they had not only a plane, but they had bombs that exploded almost simultaneously, because I just can't imagine anything being able to go through that wall. Most buildings are built with the steel is on the inside around the elevator shaft. This one was built from the outside, which is the strongest structure you can have, and it was almost just like a uh, like a can of soup. You know, Donald, we were looking at pictures all morning long of that plane coming into uh, building number two, and when you see that uh, approach the the far side, and then all of a sudden, 
Within a matter of a millisecond, the explosion pops out the other side. Right. I just think that there was a plane with more than just fuel. I think, obviously, there were very big planes. They were going very rapidly because I was also watching where the plane seemed to be not only going fast, it seemed to be coming down into the building. So it was getting the speed from going downhill, so to speak. Uh, it just seemed to me that to do that kind of destruction is even more than a big plane because you're talking about taking out steel, the heaviest caliber steel that was used in the building. I mean, these buildings were rock solid. And, uh, you know, it's just an amazing, it's an amazing thing. It's, this country is different today, and, and it's going to be different than it ever was for many years to come. Very profound statement and very true. In cities across the nation, we've also seen police officers assaulted with bricks, rocks, bats, Molotov cocktails, frozen bottles of water. Somebody said last night, one of these protesters, I saw it, he said, it's only water. How could water hurt you? Yeah, they don't say it's frozen in a bottle the size of a football, and they throw it at the police. It's unbelievable. It's water. And then they have cans of soup. Soup. And they throw the cans of soup. That's better than a brick, because you can't throw a brick. It's too heavy. But a can of soup, you can really put some power into that, right? Yes, sir. And then when they get caught, they say, no, this is soup for my family. They're so innocent. This is soup for my family. Uh, it's incredible. And you have people coming over with bags of soup, big bags of soup, and they lay it on the ground, and the anarchists take it, and they start throwing it at our cops, at our police. And if it hits you, that's worse than a brick, because it's got force. It's the perfect size. It's, like, made perfect. And when they get caught, they say, no, this is just soup for my family. And then the media says, this is just soup. These people are very, very innocent. They're innocent people. These are just protesters. Isn't it wonderful to allow protesting?